welcome to No Filter Boxing. This week we're at the famous Ingle Gym in Sheffield as we get an insight into the life of Dominic Ingle and some of his star fighters. It is a hard job. The highs are high, the lows are low. You've got to enjoy what you do. I want to be a world champion. Give me my shot and I'll prove I'm worthy of being there. I don't think I've got to prove anything to anyone because I know what I can do. I've just got to obviously put the hard work in and do it. The idea and the blue belt title will be on this table here. And we'll also hear from Tyson Fury and Frank Warren on what's been a huge week for the heavyweight division. We want those big fights. This now changes the game completely. The tables have turned yet again. Cannot wait to get back to the USA, put on the show. Dom, thanks for having us today, mate. So yeah. what have we got lined up? We're How's gonna, the day looking? We're going to do a weight session uh, with uh, Billy Joe Son as a kid, Galahad. Uh, he's going to take you into this state-of-the-art gym. It's, uh, you know, hidden around the back of a house. You wouldn't even know it's here. When you uh, say state-of-the-art, I mean, we're looking at the latest technologies. Yeah, we're looking latest. at Globo gyms. We're looking at flashing neon lights. La late latest technology. So how long have you been using this place? This, gym, has, this, th been... this has been for, like, the last 30 years on and off. So, so we've had this with Naz, we've had this with Johnny yeah. Nelson, all the, all the big names have been Look at all this rust, it's that old, there's rust on the plates. It does the job, it serves a purpose. In the winter it's freezing and in the summer it's boiling, so what more do you want? It's a gritty old school it's stuff, a is that school. the way forward? Yeah, I'm saying, you know, it's, you, you, I always rem remember watching uh, the Rocky movies and I was, I think, about 10 years old and I actually thought Rocky was a proper boxer. You know, he's training away, hitting frozen uh, ribs of beef and all this kind of stuff and Apollo Creed's in a fancy gym, pedalling on a bike and that kind of thing back then when I was 10 years old, you actually see it manifest itself, you know, later on in life when you're training people, that people actually, they start off in a rough old place and as they become a champion, they want the best of everything and a nice smooth ride and they but don't it's want... it's the hunger and the desire that it's got them. It's the hunger and the desire, I mean, you see it so often with fighters that they get to a certain level and all of a sudden, you know, um, they want everything perfect and smooth and nice and white and, and you can't have that. You've got to have hunger in the morning, you've got to have reason to get out of bed. And if you're in a nice warm bed, you know, next to your missus and your kids are downstairs, you're thinking, you can't be bothered. You've got a couple of guys waiting for you here, we've got well, Billy you can and see Barry. They're ready for the workout, they, they've been waiting patiently on the phones. Right then, ready boys, time to do some work, time to do some work. 20, yeah? I think the, uh, the thing that you always hear from fighters, will wait, slow me down. I remember the definite shift when Ricky Hatton started training with Kerry Kays and he was doing a lot of leg pressing and weights and you never really saw that before then. And it's always been a part of what we've done. Right, we're going to do some barbell to finish the biceps off, Barry. You know, when I was a kid, I used to go running with my dad. He used to drag me out of bed at nine years old and make me run. I used to hate every minute of it. You know, school holidays, I used to hate school holidays because we never got to lay in. It was always, he had a job plan. We'd be digging something up or carrying bricks or doing something. It's only in year, later years you realise that you're just being groomed to get out of bed in the morning and just be productive. If you're trying to tell an athlete like a boxer, you know, don't eat this, don't smoke that, don't drink that, be a particular way, they're going to look at you straight away and think, well, well you don't. if your belly's hanging over and you're like, you know, I've got a fag in my mouth and I'm drinking beer at the same time. They're all trainers what do that. But you've got, you've got to look the part. And to teach the art of the game is hard. Anybody can tell you to pick a weight up or do a run. But actually to teach somebody how to avoid a shot, how to tie somebody up, how to, you know, gain an extra couple of seconds when you've been on the floor, that's beyond a lot of trainers these days. It's an art form boxing for me. I mean, you look at Billy. If you didn't know Billy Joe Saunders, would you think he was a boxer? Good you won. Good man, he's got man. a straight nose, he's got no bumps over his eyes. He doesn't even look like a fighter. So that's, that's the way you want to start your career and the way you want to finish. That's it, boys, you're done. So you can have some breakfast. Now it's uh, five past nine. If you go around to Barry's, and bring your bacon, eggs and sausage over. I made the best poached eggs. What's your, what's your speciality? Eggs and toast. <laughs> is it? Yeah, yeah. Is that every day? Every day. I have eggs and toast every day. So just tell me, how did you come about joining the Ingle Gym and what did you want out of it? Did, was there anyone that you particularly looked up to that you wanted to emulate or was it just about your circumstance at the time? I started boxing when I was about 12 years old, 11, 12 years old. I, uh, I had a friend called Tris and uh, basically what happened was we were always in and out of trouble and uh, I was we were both skinny kids and we wanted to put a bit of size on, just in case, because we were moving up to secondary school, we thought we needed to get a bit bigger. We started going to this weights gym in town, 
and there was like a little ring there and I used to go in there and me and him used to mess about the spa. And after two weeks, I went to the local mosque and I seen it and I seen my mate. I said, Naz, Naz. I says, I've gone to this gym. I want to be a champion like you. He goes, oh, if you want to be a champion like me, he goes, you need to go and find this guy called Brendan Ingle. He's got a gym in Winkerbank. And um, that was it, really. That was the, that was the beginning. Obviously, you're here living with Barry now. How is it being part of the Ingle camp? <clears throat> in this gym, you either got it or you haven't. Do you know what I mean? You can you can train with us and you know we can we can all work together and we all do the same sort of thing, but when that bell goes, it's you know, we're all in good shape. It's down to you to, to produce the goods and you know it's it's good banter and we all push each other on, but we're all alone in that ring when the bell goes. So um we don't really all get mixed up and that we all have a bit of banter and a bit of laugh, but um the main thing is winning on the night. If you could have picked anyone, is it warranted? Yeah, one hundred percent. I don't believe that you know he wanted to fight me. If you could have vacated and gone on a different route or gone somewhere else, you would have. I've always wanted to fight another champion. I didn't want to fight for a vacant title, so I'm glad that Josh never vacated the title because to be the man, you've got to beat the man. I knew them guys were going to underestimate him. I think with someone with his style as well, his best asset is people underestimate him because he looks so. His style and everything about him, he just looks, he doesn't look useless, but he doesn't look very good. Just goes to show, doesn't it? Both guys underestimated him and uh, he stepped up. 2018 was his year, but 2019 is Kid Gallagher's year. You know, they say good things, ha good things happen in free. He won the world title, didn't he, against Lee Selby. Then he defended against Carl Frampton and he had two twin daughters. The looks ran out now, so 2019 is my year. Have we seen the last of you at middleweight? Definitely not, no. Um, I'm more of a natural middleweight than I am super middleweight, but, you know, you I walk around at, you know, 13, 10 anyway, like when I'm not in camp, so I don't think I've got to prove anything to anyone because I know what I can do. I've just got to obviously put the hard work in and do it. My title, what I lost, is only loaned out. They didn't beat the champion and, um, I'll prove what I've got to do at super middleweight, then I'll um, go back and get what's mine. But what do you reckon? A couple of world titles on this table? 100%. The IBF and the WBO title will be on this table here. And you're going to be you're going to be invited to come back here. And, and get so part two. And so we told you. Barry, we mentioned Frampton and Warrington. Um, neither of them have had much, many nice things to say about you in the last few weeks. Have you seen what they've said? Yeah, it is what it is, isn't it? You know, uh, can, you, can, can you say what they said? They were talking about, I think, that Barry should be banned from the sport, really, and that they hope that they both hope that, that Warrington does a number on him. Mm. I think Frampton said that, didn't he? Frampton, but Frampton... Far yeah, fighting this little <laughs> I want him to be banned as well. <laughs> Frampton's irrelevant, don't he? He's just, um, you know, I'm just... I'm just bothered about fighting winners. I don't want to be fighting losers like him. You know, uh, he's washed up and he don't live the life. You know, he's a dead, drinks Coronas, eats, you know, tacos, out of shape, little fat little man. I think this, this year, what he'll try and do is just, you know, cash himself in. If they want me to be the bad guy, I can be the bad guy. That's not a thing, is it? Everybody entitled to their own opinion. But also, everyone, everyone likes Positivity, don't they? People like people talking about them in, in, a, Listen, in, in nice not, ways. If people are not talking about you, then you're doing something wrong, good or bad. He, he probably won't, he won't, he won't, he will never fight me. I think he said that as well, hasn't he? Because he'll get oh, the I worst beating that. of his life. <laughs> What's being here in Sheffield with Dominic Ingle brought you as a fighter? It's brought me on massively because. I always trained hard, I was always pretty disciplined, you know, but I started getting to the point where I wouldn't really bothered anymore. I cheated on my diet, probably wouldn't put as much effort into training as I should have been. And I was just mainly down to not having the right people around me, which I have now, and I've got a great new trainer in Domingo. The thing is with Liam, you have to hold him back, not push him forward, because he's a million miles an hour. So. Uh, if you don't get control he of that... He loves training, doesn't he? Oh, he loves it. And like I say, he's always five minutes early. So it's, it's not a case of having to motivate him to do anything fast. It's just really 
it's a bit like, you know, he probably has got attention deficit disorder. He's all over the place. And he's just trying to Keep bring everything and compress it all into a place just for the 12 round fight. And after that, he can explode whatever he does what he wants to do. Coming off the back of a big win over Mark Heffron, how satisfying was it? It was very satisfying. Everybody wrote me off. Everybody thought I was going to get chin. Not a lot of people give me a give me my chalk really they thought I was going to get knocked out so yeah I think I, I turned a few heads and um, got people talking again. And you've got Joe Mullander coming up now in defence of your British title what does he bring to the table? If I can't put a dent in him first half of the fight then could go long it could drag out to be a bit of a um, war of attrition and you know that, that type of fight but I believe I've got way, way too much class for him and um, I believe I'm going to stop him in the first half of the fight. Is this the breakout year? Yeah, definitely, 100%. Um, obviously, I'm not saying I didn't have a good trainer before in Gary because he was great, he got me to where he got me, which is you know, a good level. And um, I just feel like I've taken our next leap forward now and um, I'm here with Dom, I'm here around the boys in the gym. Um, world champions, title challengers, you know, so you can't, you can't buy that kind of experience and I'm around here daily, so it's, it's only going to benefit me massively, isn't it? You've obviously seen your fair share, is he world champion material? I think he can, we're still, you know, I've been looking at Mungi and I think, you know, that's, that's the fight of light middleweight, I think he could win, but he's still got a lot of hard work to do and a lot of that hard work is going to be down to control and sticking to the game plan. Where do you want to be by the end of this year? I, I want to be... I want to be a world champion, so hopefully they can um, make something happen that I, I challenge for world title. Just give me my shot and I'll, and I'll prove I'm, I'm worthy of being there. This is what I'm involved in boxing for. Get myself out there and get myself known. At the same time, earn a lot of money, so that's where we're at, but we'll talk about that afterwards. John, just take his head guard off, please. After the break, we'll hear more from Dominic Ingle as he invites us into his home. And Tyson Fury explains his decision to sign a multi-fight deal with Top Rank and Queensbury Promotions. I've delivered yet again, haven't I? Coming somewhere near you. ESPN or a big station in America, so if that's where the fights are going to be, that's where they're going to be. We're going to try and ram in 30 fights in the 30 months. The tables have turned yet again. And I'm very, very, very excited about it. Cannot wait to get back to the USA, but on the show. Welcome back to No Filter Boxing. It's now time to take a look into the life of Dominic Ingle. He's part of the famous boxing family and has the hunger to carry on the family name. So Dom, you're known on Instagram as a bit of a guitarist. Yeah, I mean, uh, I bought this guitar back in, you know, when I was 14 years old, about 100 odd quid. And I thought, well, I've, I bought it now and I've invested in it, I better learn how to play it. And it, it took me a couple of months to get the hang of it. And then, you know, it's just been one of them things for the last 30 odd years, that's what I've done in between boxing or sometimes you take your mind off stuff. It's, you know, it, it is quite therapeutic, yeah. And if you were to play a gig, what would be your closeout show? What would be the grand finale? What, you know, what, what, what songs would I play? I've got a wide range of music I like, uh, you know, a wide variety. So, I don't know, probably something by Oasis or The Beatles or something like that. You know, when I was at school, I did sport, good at everything. So I did boxing, I had about 14 fights, won 12. And then I looked at the bigger picture and I thought, that's a, that's a hard way to make a living, you know, and you've got to be exceptionally good. And at the time, it was Harold Graham, um, who was a boxer coming through, and, you know, he's a fantastic fighter, I used to spar with him, body spar with him. And he wasn't getting to where he needed to be, you know, he's British, European, all these champions. And, uh, you know, he made plenty of money, but if he didn't become world champion. And I just looked at that and just thought, you know, that's a lot of time and investment. But you committed to time just in a different way. In a different way, yeah, but I'm saying, you know, it's, at the end of the day, it's not me, you know, putting my life on the line when you step into that ring, and that's, that's the difference. You can't really afford to get it wrong in this game. You know, and you can have one or two little slips. But I've seen so many kids who could have been world champion who've made big slips and they've never recovered from it. They could have been world champion, and the, and the prime example was Harold Graham. You know, he should have been a world champion. He was a better boxer than Nazim Hamed, but he never quite got there, and it's because he just made too many mistakes along the way. 
Is this your life now? It is, I've got, you know, boxing's my job. It's something I was born into. It's the family business. And I, I could never really get involved with training people because, you know, I train now and I'm, I'm dedicated to what I do. And when I see people around me, or if I'm trying to push, motivate somebody to do it and they can't do it, it frustrates me. So training people wasn't really on the horizon for me. And then you realise you have to guide them. You can't just tell them to do something. You have to cajole them, you have to con them, you have to kid them, you have to motivate them, all these things. And I think when I was younger, you know, that was hard enough to do myself, to motivate myself. And then you find a way to do it. Uh, and that's part of the art of being a trainer, that, you know, you've got to motivate these kids and show them the way because they've, they've got the ability but they just keep going off course and it's about keeping them on that path and getting them to the right point. How have things changed since your dad died? Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, I look at all the things that he achieved in his life and if you could have a life and look back on it, that's the life you want to have. You know, he helped thousands of people and that's a good thing. So his memory will always live on and that makes it a lot better. And, you know, he, he probably went a bit too soon. We could have done with a few more years out of him, you know, but um, it's not that way. And, you know, we carry on. It's not, I'm not carrying this on because, you know, that's what he'd have wanted. You know, I'm carrying on because it's what I do. You've got to enjoy what you do uh, because it is a hard job. The highs are high, the lows are low. There's a lot of emotion involved. You're dealing with kids who aren't normal kids. You can't be to do this, you know, to, to be able to get into a ring and bash somebody up or get bashed back is not normal. So, you know, you're trying to protect these kids, get them through that period of time in the career. Hopefully they make money and they don't have to have a job at the end of it. So, Winko Bank and the Ingalls, yep. they've been synonymous with boxing now for more than 20 years. Well, I'd say more than 40 years, probably, maybe. Long time, lived in this village all my life and uh, never moved too far, travelled the world, but always come back to this place. And everything's here, so we've got the gym there, the church there. I mean, the gym is linked to the church, right? Yeah, that was the, uh, the church hall, but it was originally the Winko Bank school rooms. And the vicar gave it to Brendan to use for the kids around here and he developed into a boxing gym and that's how it all started. And then there's history everywhere because what's that yellow and red building up the top there? That monstrosity up there is Nazi Mamid's old shop. They've painted it yellow now, but that's where he lived. And he'd make the, you know, the five minute walk from there to the gym every day. He'd be the first one in, in the gym, and the last one out. And he did that for years. And, uh, you know, people think he built his legs by walking up and down this hill. And your name obviously carries a lot of clout in this area because it's synonymous. You mentioned your dad there, Brendan. It's quite a legacy that you've got and you've got to carry on. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've got the Brendan Ingle way. They named this road after him a few months ago and it's, uh, it's ironic really because it used to be called Tansley Street and originally when he lived in Winkerbank, he lived up this hill when he first got married in a house up here. And then he couldn't settle, he sold the house and moved to Ireland for about a year. And then when he came back, he moved back to Winker Bank, and that's when it all started, really, yeah. So. And then this has become a big community hub. It's not just about the fighters, it's been about helping kids and people from all walks of life over all those many decades. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, the success stories out of the gym or the world champion boxers like Nazim Hamid, Johnny Nelson, Junior Witter, but, you know, the big, biggest success stories are the kids who've come in here who have never going to make it as a boxer. You know, they've gone to university, they've got degrees, they've got good jobs. They basically come from families where all the kids were heading in the wrong direction and these kids have turned themselves around and, you know, put themselves into society in a good place. So what's the goal for you now? You know, well, I, I, we've got this legacy to carry on. I mean, it wasn't my first choice of occupation. I kind of fell into it uh, out of a need for Brendan and John. They were getting overrun with kids in the gym and they couldn't handle it. And they would, Brendan wouldn't turn anybody away. So I was brought in at the low level, just dealing with all the kids who were just walking off the street. And eventually, you know, it's like when you're in a race, it's not like you're, you're running forward and you're beating everybody. It's like everybody steps back and you find yourself in front. And that's, that's what happened, basically. You know, Brendan and John took a little bit more of a back seat and I just found myself in this position. But how proud are you of the of the surname? It's fantastic, you know, to have, have a, a road named after you. Um, you know, everybody knows us. Um, we've been in this in this village a long, long time, and my dad had a lot of respect from everybody around here. Even at the height of his success with Nazim, happy to be all over the news. He'd be sweeping the streets, and people couldn't quite get their head round why some fella like Brendan Ingle would be sweeping streets, and it was just to pass the time, you know, in between gym sessions and keep the place clean. And uh, you know, that's that's what it was all about. This week saw the announcement of Tyson Fury signing a co-promotional deal with Queensbury Promotions and Top Rank. Fury will now fight on ESPN in the States as well as BT Sport in the UK. We sat down with him and Frank Warren to get the lowdown on what the deal means and what the future holds.
this now changes the game completely, but we're with the biggest. We're the ones who've got the subscribers and have got the financial clout. That's what we're with now. You know, three million subscribers. There is no bigger than ESPN in the States. No one bigger than that. Where's Wilder at now, man? <laughs> you win this fight, Tyson on Saturday, what's the plan? Very easy, just punch him in the face. <laughs> even if you could build him even more on the brand, I mean, he'd, he'd done a fantastic job out there in the States. No one made a, a beeline to go and buy it, sign Deontay Wilder. They made a beeline to come and do a deal with Tyson. That's what's happened here. So that tells you he's standing. He's the lineal champion. He's number one in the world. The fans, he's, you know, the fans love what he's done. He doesn't shy away from anything. We've just got to make sure that we can keep pushing to make these fights happen. <laughs> Having said that, they'll be shown back here on BT, so the, you know, the British fans are not going to miss out on it. And he's very conscious about the even saying, you know, of, of the support he gets here. So he's not deserting the country. That's not, not what it's about. ESPN are a big station in America, so that's where the fights are going to be. That's where they're going to be. Well, I'm going to be waiting now for Frank to tell me if it's going to be in the West Coast or the East Coast. So I can get me uh, shorts on, on my woolly coat, and make a decision where we're going to go training. So it's, it's all an exciting part of my life and career. Chapter has turned again. The tables have turned yet again. And I'm very, very, very excited about it. Cannot wait to get back to the USA, put on a show. It's over the next 30 months. That's what it is. That's multi-fight deal, and he wants to be busy. So it'll be a, over that period of time at least five or six fights. That's We're going to try and ram in 30 fights in uh, 10 months. <laughs> in the 30 months, so 10, 10 fights per 10 month. Hopefully. <laughs> at the end of the day, the fans are the ones who, who, who pay their money. They're the ones they they will want. So it's up to us to deliver. We've tried very hard to make fights. And this we see as our way forward, and Tyson's way forward, of making these things happen on his terms, on his terms, not on somebody else's terms, on his terms. I've delivered yet again, haven't I? <laughs> Coming somewhere near you. I don't even know who ESPN have got as heavyweights, but I'm not really concerned because I'm the best, best asset they've now got. So it's uh, not really concerned about any of the other fighters. Like I said, Frank will make the fights and uh, they'll make the fights as well. And that's it. I'm not really bothered who I fight, to be honest. I don't really care who it is. Just keep me busy, that's all I ask. And that's all I want to do, be kept busy and um, I'll, I'll keep well and keep training. And that's what I, what I love to do. And the name of the game is to keep him busy. He needs to be busy. Look at him, he's trained over to Christmas. He's not done that just to fight once a year. He needs to fight at least three times this year. That's where Tyson's at, that's what he wants to do, and that's what we want to deliver for him. So, you know, with us and top rank working hard together, we're going to make this happen. And, and we're hoping, we want those big fights. When I say we, I mean, we, of course, I want them. I want to see them. As a fan, I want to see them. But he wants them. In the meanwhile, I'll be swanning around Los Angeles in a dressing robe, slippers and a Lakers hat, just lounging around waiting for these fights to be made. Such a terrible life, really. <laughs> That's all we have time for this week. There's a big few months in store for the Ingle fighters and, of course, for Tyson Fury. Don't miss them in action soon on BT Sport. Bye for now. about that. Savage body shot to over the left. Great punching. Landing a solid right hand, powering on the pressure. Oh, oh what a great man. shot. And what a punch. That's a good right hand. It's good accuracy. Oh, great shot.